Welcome to today's Spark Your Health Talk, Real Self-Care with Dr. Pooja Lakshman and Lauren Smith Brody. My name is Katira Noviello Kapoor, and I am the Senior Director of Health Promotion, Wellness, and Athletics at the 92nd Street Y. This evening, we look forward to taking a deep dive into the shifting perspective of self-care and how to get started in a new direction of caring for yourself. We hope you will also be able to join us for upcoming Spark, Spark Your Health talks. On March 29th, we welcome Nancy Collier back for an in-person workshop on rediscovering your independence within a relationship. And on April 4th, with the release of Unhunched, author Aisha Tahir and I will discuss the importance of wellness through posture. We will leave 15 minutes at the end of our program for questions, which will be collected from the chat. So please feel free to submit your questions throughout the duration of the program. I am now pleased to introduce our moderator this evening, Lauren Smith Brody. Lauren Smith Brody is CEO of the Fifth Trimester Movement, which supports all working parents and caregivers to advance women's leadership and build gender equity in the workforce. Lauren has been a featured speaker at companies and organizations across the Fortune 500 and writes regularly for publications such as the New York Times, Slate, and Elle. Lauren is a best-selling author and a co-founder of the Chamber of Mothers, a national nonprofit movement focusing on America's attention on mothers' rights. Lauren, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katira. Um, and thank you to the Y and thank you to everybody who is joining us tonight. Um, we're really excited to honor and share um, my dear friend Pooja Lakshman's new book and to talk all about the principles behind it. Um, first, let me just do her formal intro and then we'll jump right in. Pooja and I are... Um, I think it's not a secret, we're also really good friends. So we're hoping that tonight will feel um, really warm and inclusive and um, almost like a glimpse um, into a maybe a sanitized version of the chat that we have going kind of at all times on our phones. So Dr. Pooja Lakshman is a psychiatrist specializing in women's mental health. She is a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at the George Washington University School of Medicine. She is the founder of Gemma, which we'll talk about, the digital community focused on women's mental health and equity, and she is a contributor to the New York Times. Pooja has spent thousands of hours, thousands, maybe even tens of thousands, taking care of women struggling with burnout, despair, depression, and anxiety in her clinical practice. Her, wo her work focuses on the intersection of mental health and gender. She helps women in marginalized groups heal from the tyranny of faux self-care. This is really what we're going to be talking about tonight. If those, if that idea of the tyranny of faux self-care is new to you, you're going to, you're going to totally be subscribed to it by the end of this talk while exposing the systems that have gotten us here. Personally, I just want to add that Pooja cracks my brain and heart open almost every day um, on Instagram with her posts and support for her community by text on our phones um, and in our nonprofits uh, WhatsApp channels um, where we work together behind the scenes on the Chamber of Mothers, a nonprofit we co-founded with several of our friends, both pro by providing huge reframes and unravelings of some of the internalized bias that I have about myself. And I hope that this is something that you can take from what she says tonight too. Um, and just with straight up practical advice, she is a gift to all of us as we as a whole society really reckon with injustices, inequities, unfairnesses, and with the undeniable optimism of being a parent now, um, which she is too. So hi, Pooja. I'm so glad hi, to be here. It is such a pleasure to be here. And it was like, I feel like I'm just like grinning from ear to ear and beaming so deeply from the bottom, the bottom of my depths. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction. And I'm so excited for this conversation. And, and like you were saying, I really, um, I hope that, or I, you know, it just, it feels like, um, I want it to just feel really warm and I want really everybody here to leave with a real sense and understanding of why everything feels so hard. And also with kind of takeaways that are really grounded in real self-care. So 
I'm excited. <laughs> and you are living it right now because you've had one of the biggest days, honestly, of your life um, with the launch of your book, Real Self Care. Today, you were on Good Morning America today. You have done, I don't even know how many interviews and um, live conversations. And just thank you for saving energy for us at the end of your day. And we're so excited to celebrate you and to um, kind of welcome this reframe for our entire culture, I really feel like what you've written is going to change things for individuals, but also then ripple out to our understanding as a society of the supports that we deserve, um, the problems that are not individual to be solved, but actually systemic. And that's really what I have learned from you over these years. Um, we're actually seeing a chat here that says, I cannot see or hear anything. I hope that's not universal. If anybody else is feeling that way, please type in so we know that it's not just this one person. Um, so let's start. So I would love to start with a word that you and I both sort of feel funny about, which is journey. Let's talk about your journey, Pooja. Um, I don't like to overuse the word brave, but the first 12 pages of, okay, so we're getting confirmation that people can see in here. Um, I don't like to overuse the word brave, but it is not an overstatement in this case that the first 12 pages of your book, real which I have right here, are genuinely brave. I knew some of the story behind them before reading them. And even still, I thought, wow, I'm amazed that she is going this personal, this deep to really set up the why of this book. Um, can you tell us just um, what drew you to wanting to write this book and to being able to write this book? And maybe um, just can you give us sort of the short version of the intro so that others can know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think to, um, give some context. For me, it was really important, even though I'm a psychiatrist, oh, I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, if you can't just drop a, a note in the chat. But, um, you know, it was really important for me to come from a place of humanity, right? I'm a psychiatrist, but I am first and foremost a human and a woman. And I have had, as I talk about in the introduction of the book, um, my own deeply heartbreaking experience with wellness. And um, in writing Real Self Care and figuring out how to tell my personal quote unquote journey, <laughs> as cliche as it sounds, um, I decided to put that story up front in the introduction because. I thought that, um, like, I wanted people to really understand that, yes, I wrote a prescriptive self-help book, but I'm not writing it from the ivory tower. Even though I have these credentials, I'm writing it really from a place of deep personal experimentation and heartbreak and compassion and understanding. And so long story long, I mean, the basic gist of it is that I, so I'm 39 now. Um, and as you mentioned, I have a little son who's nine months old, but about a decade ago, I um, was in my late twenties and I had sort of followed all the rules that I was supposed to, you know, my parents are South Asian. My dad's a doctor, they're immigrants, you know, so it was like, you know, went to Penn, went to the Ivy League schools, you know, got into the fancy schools, became a doctor, got married. I had sort of checked every box off the list. And I was a second year psychiatry resident. And it was sort of like, okay, well, I did all the things I'm supposed to. And now, so now let me figure out how to be happy. Like now I can, you know, try and figure out this happiness thing, um, which I recognize is obviously completely, uh, you know, backwards. Um, and I didn't, I didn't know how, because I had used that external lens the whole time to find my path. And so, and then from the other side, I was a psychiatry resident and I was in a clinical setting working on inpatient units. And, you know, my patients, people were coming in, like, for example, somebody who's unhoused coming into the ER. And the only thing I can do is like, you know, prescribe Zoloft, but this mm -hmm. person needs housing right? Or like the patient who, you know, lost childcare three times in a month and was getting fired from her job. And so it's kind of like, okay, well, I can do psychotherapy with you, but what we really need is fair labor laws. So I felt really powerless. Um, so I just basically broke everything. You know, I, I left my marriage, 
I moved into a commune in San Francisco, um, one that was focused on female orgasm and meditation. Um, and I dropped out of my residency program. Um, so, you know, my Indian parents and my cat Fifi just oh. always loves to join all conversations. So, um, so, you know, my Indian parents were really thrilled that this was happening. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and all my friends were just sort of like, what happened to Pooja? But you know, what I learned during this was that you can't, um, you, there is no external solution. You can't just pick up some wellness practice. You can't, um, no guru can tell you how to live your life and like real wellness, real well being comes in your own life in your actual decisions. And, you know, I tried to run away from all my problems and that didn't work. Um, so that's the deeply personal part of this book. And then, you know, fast forward, coming back to medicine um, and coming on the faculty at George Washington University and specializing in perinatal psychiatry and then sort of seeing like, gosh, like, well, this wellness culture has just taken over. And, and then, you know, knowing this personal history that I had, it, it felt, um, it, it turned out that I had a book in me about this. <laughs> it just took some time, right? Yes, yes, yes. So tell us, okay, so what actually is faux self-care? And I will say that I first got to know your work. Um, I can't believe how recently this is because I feel like I know you so well as a friend. Um, but with um, a story of yours that ran in the New York Times that referred to the tyranny of self-care. And I think the headline was, it's not burnout, it's betrayal, which I think roots it very much in pandemic times. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and how that um, solidified this idea for you of faux self-care? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I think there's kind of two bullets there that are really kind of important as we're sort of reconceptualizing and reframing. So the first is that the problem, the real problem is in the systems of oppression. So whether we're talking about our shared work with Chamber of Mothers and the fact that we still don't have mandated paid parental leave, right? Um, or we're talking about the fact that, you know, 30 million Americans don't have health insurance or a quarter of working Americans aren't able to take a paid sick day, right? All of those structural policy decisions impact our own individual personal mental health and well being. And when you use the language of burnout or resilience, you're completely exonerating the system when the system is what we need to change. So I, um, I wanted to reframe the entire conversation of self care to be on um, putting the onus on the systems to uh, heal right? To, to be reformed. Um, and so the way that I went about it is um, this distinction between methods versus principles. So in real self-care, I um, explain the concept of faux self-care as like a method. So here's sort of an example that hopefully will make it a, a little bit more accessible. So you know, you're, let's say you finally worked up the nerve to take a half day off from work and you, um, you know, scheduled a massage for yourself and you dropped like 200 bucks, probably more in New York city to get a massage. <laughs> and then you spend the whole time on the massage table, just like worried about your to-do list, ruminating about everything that's on your plate. Um, you know, then you feel guilty that you've wasted the money and not actually enjoyed the massage. Then you come back to your desk and you have like 50 emails that you have to respond to, feel like you need to make up for all that lost productivity. So the reason that happens is because we're trying to employ a method, right? And whether that method is a massage, a bubble bath, a yoga class, but we haven't done the internal process of real self-care, which is based on these principles that we'll talk about. When you use these Band-Aid method solutions, you aren't acknowledging that the actual problem, the actual um, issue is inside our social systems. And that's, you know, whether we're talking about things like white supremacy, whether we're talking about end stage capitalism, whether we're talking about, you know, patriarchy and sexism, right? Like there's a million isms that you can insert. Um, 
And, you know, I think that when we, frankly, as women, when you're sort of sold these commercial consumer oriented methods, it, um, it's condescending, right? It's condescending to say that you can just sort of like take a bubble bath and have a glass of wine and like they're there, you know, you'll be fine. It normalizes the lack of supports too. You don't even question what you don't have access to in terms of, you know, like you were saying, paid family leave, sick days, um, basic human rights that around the rest of the world are really seen as basic human rights covered by law. Um, Okay, so, but I'm imagining that um, in your office, I wish I could be in your office with you right now. Um, you can't just grab somebody by the shoulders and shake them and make them go like, it's not you, it's the system, right? Believe me, I try. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I think it is so helpful that you have really boiled it down to four main principles. Um, and these to me feel like the breakthroughs. Maybe can you tell us about what it's like when someone employees, first of all, tell us what they are, the four, and tell us what it's like when someone employs one of, one of them or when they have that breakthrough moment. Um, what does that look like? Are there some examples? And if you don't have one top of head, I'm happy to give you plenty of ways that I have not set, set boundaries or, you know, like <laughs> talk to myself mainly. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe I'll kind of talk through the four principles and then I'll speak a little bit to kind of the example and the way that it actually shows up. So, and I'll say this, you know, the principles aren't anything revolutionary. Like I'm not recreating the wheel here. And it's the same thing that lots of folks talk about. Um, The reason that we all talk about a lot of the same things is because they're really hard to do. Um, (laughs) And so that's something that I really deeply acknowledge in the book too, that this isn't like quick fix, easy solution type thing. It's like, um, no, here's a map. And these are things that you can work on. So principle one is setting boundaries. And especially in my patient practice where I work predominantly with mothers, um, solely with people who identify with women, the number one thing that comes up with boundaries is of course guilt, right? You feel selfish, you feel bad that you're letting people down. Um, So getting a handle on boundaries for me always boils down to being able to tolerate guilt and understand that just because you feel guilty doesn't mean that you're making the wrong choice. You can feel guilty and still take action in a manner that serves you or your family, people you care about. Um, The guilt itself isn't your moral compass. That's principle one, because that's like how we make our space, right? Right. Principle two is developing self-compassion in the way that you talk to yourself. And I am certainly somebody who, you know, I always thought of self-compassion as like this very woo-woo, like crystal type thing and like would roll my eyes at it. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I was working on the book and sort of thinking about what these principles were and sort of coming up with the conceptualization, I realized that- they made um, you do an outline and you were like, oh, okay. Let's boil it (laughs) Everything that's in the air. Right, right. Um, I come back actually to psychological flexibility and the work of Dr. Kristen Neff, who is an amazing psychologist and best-selling author and probably the foremost researcher in the world um, on self-compassion. And she describes self-compassion as um, developing a new type of relationship with your thoughts. So it's not like you're just repeating mantras or affirmations. It's more like when you hear that voice in your head that's saying, gosh, you're such a bad mom because you didn't bake cupcakes for school. You're actually looking at that voice and you're saying, huh, like that's really curious that I expect myself to be able to make cupcakes, you know, at 9 PM after I've had a terribly long day at work and I'm exhausted and I, you know, don't have, uh, childcare and right. Like you're bringing the systems into it and you're able to, um, really sort of like step back from that inner critical voice and challenge it. The third principle, and we can dig more into this one because it's the crux of everything is sort of getting clear on your values and making choices that are aligned with what really works for you. And this is how real self-care is different because it's not about Again, it's not about like just taking 15 minutes out to meditate. It's like real self-care actually is in your decision-making. It's 
how you decide who is going to be your life partner. It's how you decide whether you're going to become a parent or not. Um, it's how you make decisions in your career. Like it's threaded through everything. And then the last principle is that this is actually power. You know, I, I think I quote Audre Lorde like at least three times in the book, <laughs> yeah. um, right? And so Audre Lorde uh, says that self-care is self-preservation, mm-hmm. right? And especially if you're a woman of color, if you're especially if you're somebody who's historically been marginalized in America, taking ownership of your time, of your energy, of your life, like that's actually, that's agency. And that's how we take our power back from these systems that are constantly pushing against us. So, okay, that was super long-winded, but the, I want to give an example. And so one of the examples from the book um, is a patient of mine. Um, and it was funny when I was thinking of examples, when I was writing about this patient, I really immediately thought of your work, Lauren, with the fifth trimester, just because this is something that you do with your your clients. Um, so um this was a patient who came to me originally because she was struggling with depression, anxiety, and, you know, she started medication. We work, we were started therapy that kind of, um, was under control. And then we started working on this process of boundaries and compassion. And what came out through that was that she was deeply resentful at her husband, Mm -hmm. um, because they had two kids and her husband worked in startup world. And he had never asked for a paternity leave. And he'd always felt like, well, you know, I work at these small startups. Like, you know, I just don't want to take the risk. Like there's not a budget for that type of thing. You know, he just never felt like it was um, an option to take that risk. And so um, she called him out on it and they had multiple really hard conversations. Like it wasn't just one thing. Like this was a months long process. And um, she got pregnant with her third baby and um, he, you know, stepped up and asked his boss for a parental leave. And they said, yes. And they said, yes, we need to offer you. And, you know, we need to do this to retain talent. So that change went on to impact everybody else that worked at this company. This is why real self-care is so revolutionary because it is a personal solution that lives in your choices. And when we're talking about, for women in particular, when we're talking about your choices, really what we are talking about is your relationships, Mm -hmm. right? And how you show up in your relationships and how you take space in your relationships and what you ask for. And so when you do this type of work, that then has these cascade effects. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've just monologued for a very long time, but <laughs> no, I'm, I'm soaking it all up. I'm so appreciative. And I, I love that the example you gave was work related, but actually in her home, like she was probably having those conversations on the couch in her kitchen. Right. I'm curious what changes, if anything, um, when you, um, overlay a power dynamic there, like if we're talking about, Um, in a work setting, you know, where someone is working for someone else or in a system that is just not set up to support them. What does real self-care look like there? How can you make a little bit of traction that actually is tending to yourself in a way that's productive? Yeah. Um, That's a really good question. And so, um, and it's a, it's a common question, I think, because there's so many folks who are, kind of, um, lacking that agency because of the hierarchy in the organization. Um, so I always think about my, my own experience as, uh, now a physician, but previously as a medical student. Mm -hmm. And if there's anybody sort of on the call that is in medicine or has interacted in the medical training system, you know, that it is so hierarchical and super old school and just very like respect your elders. Don't ask for anything. Don't make noise. Um, And so I remember at the time I was a third year medical student on my surgical rotation. And for me, real self-care during that time, um, was asking my team to, to know my name. Like that was a time where people, like people just didn't even, it was just, Hey, med student. Right. Um, that doesn't fly now. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it might still fly now, but that was like kind of saying like, Hey, can you call me by name? Like my name's Pooja. Right. Um, that was real self-care. 
right? Um, and so it wasn't something like, no, I wasn't able to advocate for paid sick days off or like anything big or dramatic, but it was like these deeply personal um, decisions about self-respect, yeah. right? Um, so sometimes it can be that type of thing, or even, you know, many of my patients are, you know, new moms in the throes of, you know, taking care of really young kids. And it's like the things like, you know, I'm going to use the bathroom when I have to use the bathroom, right? Yeah. I'm yeah. going to sit down and I'm going to actually eat the sandwich for lunch. I'm not going to just like eat everybody else's crumbs. Yeah. Um, but again, it comes back to, it's less about the thing and it's more about how do you think about your choices, mm -hmm. right? And what choices are even available to you? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about how to make change in a world where you may not feel like you have a lot of choices. Um, I wanted to ask you because what brought us together initially, you know, beyond just friendship was our chamber of mothers work, um, which were a national nonpartisan nonprofit and the advocacy there. I'm curious if you consider yourself an activist, an advocate, um, and I think for some, for maybe even most people, those feel like heady terms. Those feel like, oh, like I can, I can barely like make sure that, you know, my kid's teeth is brushed every day. Like, I don't know that I'm going to have time to be an advocate too, but is there a way to do that on a very personal, small scale that doesn't necessarily mean starting a nonprofit? I mean, it's, it's interesting to me that in our group, you know, many of us have come to this work actually after having gotten through the baby stage and you entered it like pregnant, you know, like at the very, very beginning of motherhood, most of us had, were able to make space for it really because we'd gotten through those very physical early years of motherhood. Sorry, that's a whole lot in one question, but essentially like, do you consider yourself an advocate? What does it mean for just any average person whose life is already burstingly full um, to find some satisfaction and real self-care in advocacy? Yeah. Um, I think that you know, I think that advocacy work takes so many different forms and some of the most powerful advocates that I know would never even call themselves an advocate. They are just doing things. I shouldn't say just, but it's, it's about how they engage in their community and the way that they go out of the way to be generous and to pay it forward. Um, I think about this all the time, or more recently, I've been thinking about this as my son is in, is in daycare. Right. And we know, you know, how, um, underpaid most childcare workers are, and most childcare workers also are immigrants, right. They're more likely to be black and Brown and, um, just to act as like a professional woman who, you know, usually it's like so hectic and harried at drop off, but to kind of like stop and get to know the people that are taking care of your kids and, you know, to have conversations with folks that normally are not in your social sphere. You know, Angela Garbus talks about this in her work too. Um, Essential Labor is her brilliant book um, where we're kind of like talking about this care work, which is really essentially it's about time and how you're generous with your time and how you're generous with your energy and the way that you um, take it outside of, you know, I, I want to say like the cat system, right? That's like, exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I think like, that's one thing that I think about a lot, like sort of like actually, you know, the last chapter of real self-care is, is all about power, right? And I mentioned Chamber of Mothers as sort of an example, right? Like you were saying, most of the women who came together to found this organization are already kind of done um, being able to take advantage of paid leave, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh the responsibility that comes with real self-care if you're somebody who does have privileges mm -hmm. and I use that in like sort of the word privilege in the broadest sense because we're talking we're not just talking about like skin color or gender identity we're also talking about like you know resources education like you know um where you are in your company in terms of power right if you have some extra can you pour that in to the people who need it and that can take the form of sort of formalized advocacy work, or that could just be like showing up in your community and being a good human, 
that cares and wants to actually spend time without expecting anything in return. I would imagine also as a parent, that provides a lot of modeling um, for your kids. And I'm wondering, I know that um, baby K is, um, is only nine months, but I know this is on your mind and you certainly help a lot of, a lot of women who have children who are um, really, who are, you know, not infants anymore. How do we model self-care for our kids, but also how do we teach them self-care and how do we do that in a way that doesn't like deplete our own reserves? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't claim to have all the answers on this, um, because I'm not a child psychiatrist and I also only just have a nine month old. So I'm very much figuring it out. <laughs> as I go. Um, I think it really all comes down to environments mm-hmm. and, you know, especially for kids, this is about making space for feelings, mm-hmm. right? Um, real self-care is about knowing yourself and making decisions from a place that is aligned with your individual unique values. And in particular for kids as they're developing, that means like them having the open space to figure out when I say open space, I mean, metaphorically, like emotionally to, um, figure out your department. Totally fine. (laughs) Right, right, right. Yes. It's okay. Right. right, Exactly. (laughs) Um, the space to figure out, to experiment, to get to know themselves, right? Like that's the thing. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of like, I think as a parent, like it's more about setting the conditions Mm -hmm. and knowing that there's like a range, right? It's like, you have an optimum range that those conditions are in. There's going to be times that you screw up. Like you're going to yell sometimes, like it's fine. Right. But there's a range. And then if you're in that kind of optimal range, which is wide, then it will happen. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, I think, and we were talking as we were sort of prepping for this and you were asking me about this. And I think, um, especially as kind of a first time author and balancing, you know, Gemma, the company that I run and my practice, Mm -hmm. um, I did make some like pretty discreet self-care choices in the lead up to the book. Um, You know, I um, decided to combo feed with formula Mm -hmm. um, from the beginning. Um, and I, I actually last year wrote a piece for the New York times about my, you know, kind of how I centered my mental health in kind of like the motherhood journey. Um, and then I also made the decision like about two months ago to stop pumping and to go completely to formula. Cause I was like, you know what, I want to be able to go on a book tour Mm -hmm. and I want, I don't want to deal with like FedExing breast milk. Like I just, I'm not going to do it. I just, it didn't feel it felt too hard. Um, and so like giving myself permission to make that choice, um, because I knew how much I really wanted to give this book every chance it could have. And, and it's, it's also my baby, right. Mm -hmm. In a different way, obviously. Um, and that's a hard choice to make. And I'm not saying that's the right choice for anybody. I'm not knocking breastfeeding, like, but you know, it's, but it's like, you have to know, like none of these choices are easy, right? You have to grapple with like what is aligned for you. And then you have to make those choices. And then you have to just let other people have their opinions, right? Yeah. Like compromise is not a bad word, right? It's it's a conscious compromise. And I I love that in some ways this is going to sound twisted, but you were like investing in your future ability to not feel resentful or guilty, right? Yes. Um, And I love that you had clarity on that. I actually wonder if in some ways you were able to to foresee that maybe not want to see better, but like, you know, just more clearly than a lot of other new mothers because treated. So when you're seeing in your office or seeking help, they're having probably a hard time um, or they need support because they did have a hard time and now they want to, you know, continue to feel steadier. Um, how did that impact your, um, your decisions around becoming a mother? Um, you know, just having been so bathed in, you know, um, like a lot of, a lot of um, ambivalence um, from other women and difficulties and how has that made, how has that touched your motherhood experience so far? Your journey, Pooja. Yeah. Um, 
in so many ways, I think, um, you know, it took me until I was, I guess, like 37 to sort of come around to um, the idea. And, um, and ultimately, we conceived through IVF. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, uh, I had a long time, maybe to sort of process this. And I will say that, you know, I've been in psychoanalysis um, for the past seven years and, and, you know, the type where you're on the couch. And so if we have time, we can talk a little bit about that too. Um, yeah. but, um, so that was a really important space for me to understand if I wanted to become a mother and, um, and really one of the things that came out of that actually was realizing that part of yeah. what drew me to perinatal psychiatry was that it was sort of a safe space mm -hmm. for me to, be close to motherhood, but also be, um, have some distance, right. And to see what it was like, oh, see yeah. if there's a way, was a way to do it, you know, as a South Asian American, um, the model of motherhood that I had in my own family would definitely leaned heavily on martyrdom. And so I was like, is it possible to be your whole human self and also be a mother? Right. Um, so, you know, I think I like to say like that, I think like ambiv the ambivalence is our friend in motherhood. Like I, um, was really relieved and happy that when I had Kieran, that I felt this overflow of love and joy and connection to him. Um, and I still do. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I also do still feel ambivalent of the ways in which it um, limits, right? Mm -hmm. It limits your capacity and it, there's very real trade-offs and um, it's a tough job. Um, <laughs> so I think in the end, like I hate to sort of like be a person that sort of ties it up in a bow, Maybe I'll tie two bows. Um, one bow is that I do think that, like, I don't think there's any one right answer. Like, I think that um, the folks that sort of question whether this is for them, and if you decide it's not, like, I think that's great. I think it's so great to embrace that choice. Um, and I'll say that I think what I've learned so far in these early stages of motherhood is that the way that it's let me forced me to let go of control mm -hmm. has actually been really, really helpful um, in lots of areas question, of my life. I have a question about that. This is out yeah. of left field. We've never discussed this. Yeah. <laughs> you and I were both raised by families and I think really sort of socialized and conditioned to be real achievers. And, um, you know, something I have found as an adult is that when I can manage my expectations, when I can lower my expectations, in some ways, that's a form of real self-care for me. Um, like it strikes me as interesting that, you know, you had written about the the normalcy of having ambivalent feelings about becoming a mother. And then you were delighted to actually feel the joy. Like, I don't think that's necessarily a coincidence, although of course, you know, brain chemistry is what it is, right? Like, um, and not necessarily within our control, but how do you feel about, about lowered expectations? How do we do that if we want to, um, to me, it's, it's, it feels like a loss in some ways of ambition to say like, oh, I just am not going to expect the best, you know, um, I want, I want to expect and deserve, um, the world. What do I do about that? <laughs> Dr. <Dr. Yeah>. Lack. <laughs> yes. <laughs> do we have another hour? Right. Um, <laughs> um, I think the way that I would take that is again, coming back to internal versus external. Mm -hmm. In that, so I, I had to cope with this in, in a rough and a tough way with Gemma, with my company, which I, I founded with two psychiatrist colleagues, um, Dr. Lucy Hutner, who's actually in New York and Dr. Callie Cyrus. Um, and we felt really strongly that we didn't want Gemma to be a telemedicine platform. We really wanted it to be a space for education. So we're, we're building like the masterclass of women's mental health and we're doing it totally bootstrapped. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, kind of like trying to build an organization, a business, a company, 
um, when you've never done it before. Um, and you are sort of seeing all these other very shiny organizations and companies that are like getting all this money and everyone's, you know, it's like you saying they're getting all the money. There's a lot of like sparkle <laughs> and shine. Right. The funding goes to <laughs> bad companies. Right? right. This is true. Yes. Thank you. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I think that it's really easy to get caught in that rat race when mm -hmm. you are using this external lens. So like when we talk about this word ambition, it's sort of like, whose ambition is it? Mm -hmm. And what is the cost to that ambition? And is there a way to, um, is there something that happens when you bring real self-care to it and you come back to your real values, which for me with Gemma is like, I want to build something meaningful with my friends, right? Or like, you know, what we're doing at Chamber of Mothers, right? Like it really comes back to the process and the relationships. And like, if it takes off, great, right? But um, the real part of it that fills me up is knowing that I'm putting something good into the world. Mm -hmm. And and the same can be said of the book too, of, you know, the, the, the text messages that we've had, you know, where it's sort of like, gosh, it's so anxiety provoking to birth a creative work and to just not know what's going to happen or how it's going to do. And ultimately I think maybe some of the um, centering that parenthood brings mm -hmm. makes it a little bit I don't want to say that it's easier, but makes it a little bit closer to some of those, that values language. I think it distills it, right? Because yeah. I think particularly, maybe it's not even just being a, a parent. It's whenever you have cared one-on-one -on -one for someone, the idea that your book could, you know, could sell a million copies and be a bestseller. That sounds wonderful, obviously, but you get feedback from one person, one person who said, who says, this helped me make a good decision. This really changed the way I feel about myself. I'm never going to call myself lazy again. Like you hear that one very specific takeaway from one person. And it's, it feels the same way as like, you know, getting an, I love you, mommy from your, from your child in some ways, you know, it's just that immediate feedback where, you know, you've had impact. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very I went to, um, when I, and, and that's what I've been holding on to. And like, that's yes. the fuel, right? Like the other stuff is just like the quick dopamine hits. Yeah. But that stuff is like the real nourishment. Um, no when I, when I went to wanting to scale it though, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is what Gemma's about, honestly, yeah. right? It's yeah. a way for you to offer access to education to a whole lot of people all at once. I actually have, I have specific questions about Gemma. Can I ask you? Yeah. yeah. Um, so some of it is about privacy and social media, and there just aren't that many psychiatrists on social media. And I know that that is in some ways, just because the field is, you know, really protects private privacy. Um, and yet, you know, at the same time, there's this, um, real stigma around talking about mental health that has fallen away. And I just, I'm curious how you've made it work um, initially, maybe just in your own enormous Instagram following. Um, and then I'm curious, Gemma grew out of that. Um, and um, wait, third question, like all wrapped in together, you do such a beautiful job of representing um, your patient's stories in real self-care um, and yet doing it in a way that is protective of their identities too. So I guess I'm asking about um, privacy, psychiatry, what we make visible. Um, can you talk about that a little bit and how Gemma yeah. maybe solves for some of that? Yeah, um, I think it's such an important conversation and a really, it's like an evolving one and a nuanced one. You know, when I first started my Instagram account at the end of 2018, there were like very few psychiatrists on Instagram and there's still not a ton. Um, and I felt um, that I was uh, kind of breaking the rules on, you know, being public, public on social media and, you know, talking about the fact that I had, had depression and anxiety or taken medication or, you know, all these different things. And so, um, one of the things that helped me get clear again on my values, on why I was making the decision to come to social media and how I was going to do it was my own psychoanalysis. And I really 
fortunate and grateful to have an analyst who um, is very compassionate and non-withholding and, you know, maybe a little bit, um, you know, outside the typical Freudian, you know, kind of like blank slate. For, for anybody who's not familiar with, you know, what is therapy versus what is, you know, a course of CBT versus what is psychoanalysis? How does it, how, what, yeah, what yeah. So psychoanalysis is the type of uh, treatment where you are laying on the couch and the analyst is sitting behind you. It's more exploratory. The New Yorker cartoon. (laughs) Yes, exactly. 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 It's more exploratory where you're kind of, the goal is to sort of dig a little bit more into the unconscious. Um, Mm -hmm. Whereas things like CBT um, and ACT and and even psychodynamic psychotherapy tend to be a little bit more targeted and structured um, Mm -hmm. because you're face-to-face and um, there's less, uh, I guess it's more contained. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, but the way in which my analysis was helpful is it helped me verbalize and point out what was bringing me to Instagram. And the thing that was bringing me to Instagram was that, um, I had, you know, I was burnt out from academic medicine. Um, and I realized that my strong suit was not writing academic papers. I was bored to death (laughs) doing that. Citations. Uh, Right. Right. Um, and then I was feeling the anger of, of the injustice that was going on for my patients. Um, and you know, this was in the wake, like this was after Trump was elected and, you know, um, so I felt like it was sort of the only way for me to have a voice. It was really through my own kind of, um, channeling that, like trying to find a space for myself really. And to also speak to women who, didn't have the privilege of being able to be in my private practice, didn't live in Washington, DC. So I couldn't see them because I wasn't licensed right in their state. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was an access issue, but then I had to really think carefully about what do I disclose? And, you know, that's one of the decisions that I've made now is not to, um, you know, post my son's picture on social media. Um, Partly that's also because I talk about things like gun violence and abortion. And so, you know, once you do that on the internet, you know, it's terrible. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted him to, to be able to decide how, how online he wants to be. Um, I'm going off on a tangent here, but I think, you know, I think your original question was sort of about Gemma. And so one of the things that we've been thinking about is, you know, we're not therapy, mm-hmm. we're not medication. We're like this third space of education. And I think all of us sort of know that social media is broken you can't just like stick people in a Facebook group and expect anything productive to come. So everything you make for social media is owned by the platform. I mean, yeah, yeah, Yeah. right. Right. It's totally exploitative. So, um, so we're kind of like really trying to curate, is there a space for facilitated education Mm -hmm. that is, um, you know, by it's it, and it's also sort of by life stage because I think you know the three of us really understand that this is much larger than just the pregnancy postpartum conversation. This is about midlife, yeah. and this is about taking care of you know aging par- parents, right? Um, or this is about being someone who is in your late twenties or early thirties and like trying to make decisions about your career and whether to be a parent or not, right? Like, there's just so much in there that is impacted by our social context, but we haven't yet had a, um, like a smart, uh, productive way to talk about mental health in that context. So, um, you know, that was a very inarticulate way to say it, but, but, you know, come back in a year and I'll have more to tell you. (laughs) I I do have one more. I I don't want to belabor the, the psychoanalyst, um, psychoanalysis, um, line of questions, but, um, 
uh, the field, I mean, it, it, it it has a, a mixed reputation, right? I mean, you know, like I have a, a sweatshirt my sister gave me that says hysterical woman and it's meant to be cheeky, right? It's meant to be a feminist message. And, you know, I wore it to therapy one time and my therapist was like, you know, that's extremely sexist. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like how do you, how do you reckon in your own work and in how you teach real self-care to your patients um, and in the book with, um, some of the sexism that's in the history of the field of therapy, you know, for, for decades. Yeah. You know, um, I think you're being generous in your description of psychoanalysis. <laughs> um, I think the history of psychiatry in general is pretty terrible. You know, there's just a lot, um, there to be really embarrassed about. And I think that's, so what the lens that I bring to it is that this is another place where there's this power imbalance, right? So what, you know, talking about social media, the thing that social media has done is it's democratized mm-hmm. therapy, Excellent. right? And so, now, yeah. but now we're like seeing all these articles where it's like, oh gosh, everybody thinks they have ADHD because like Gen Z is talking about ADHD on TikTok, right? And so it's sort of like, well, yes, okay. Like, no, not, not everybody has ADHD and Like, it's actually, it's a, it's good that the playing field is starting to become more leveled. And I think that at least my understanding of the field of where psychoanalysis is right now is that I think the people inside really are grappling with issues of racism, issues of identity, um, and trying to like figure out how to move forward in a way that is more modern and equitable. And, um, I don't know that they have an answer yet, but it does seem like it's a conversation that's happening more in psychoanalytic circles. Um, a lot of them in New York. Um, so, so that at least is good. We have good questions that have come in. I'm going to share them um, from people in the audience. So in your research, what patterns did you find most prevalent in why people practice self-care? What are people hoping to get from that candle or that bath? Is it escapism? Is it not enough work-life balance? I'm curious what patterns were seen. Yeah. Um, so there was actually three that came out that I talk about. So one is escape definitely with the bath or the yoga retreat or the mani-pedi. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? I can, yeah. It just broke up for two seconds. Okay. Good. Um, Yeah. So definitely the first is escape. That's a really common one. And, you know, I think of that as like the mani-pedi, the bath, um, any of those things. The second one actually is um, achievement. So that's the person that makes wellness or self-care their new thing, right? And I talk about this myself. When I was in med school, I got really into yoga um, and I was like really obsessive about it. And I realized that I brought all of that perfectionism and type A-ness to yoga, which is like the complete opposite of what yoga is supposed to be, (laughs) Least favorite thing you will never. I I exercise many days. You will never see me posting about my exercise on social media. <laughs> um, and then the other one that came up that was a little bit um surprising to me is um productivity or efficiency. So this is like the task rabbits and the um yeah meal delivery kits. Yeah. Not that those things are bad, like I'm not trying to demonize them, but you have to be mindful of like, are you just trying to optimize your whole life? Mm-hmm. And when do you actually step back? When is when is it optimized enough? And you just you know. Out. Yeah. Um, and then when do you step back and actually do the other things that you're optimizing for? Right, right. Like, are you avoiding the real thing that you... Yeah want to be thinking about and doing. Um, I love this question. Um, Can you talk more on methods of how to let go of control in parenting or just in life in general? For example, when things become undone and stray and I stray from my structured plan, any tips on learning to just let it go? 
Gosh, I feel like you're speaking to my soul on, you know, at, with this book launch. Um, yeah. I had to, you know, kind of like really uh, practice this one really hard. Um, what do I want to say here? I think there's two sort of positions that somebody can take here and you have to sort of figure out which one you align with more. Are you somebody that when stuff is out of your control, do you grip? Like, do you become like hyperactive and you're just sort of like going, 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 or are you somebody who just sort of like falls over and becomes really passive? And, you know, the goal I think is to be in the middle somewhere. Um, so in terms of actual constructive methods, the one, the first I would say is to acknowledge and actually name for yourself, like what is out of my control. I don't have control over like whether my kid gets sick, um, next week and I have to be, you know, have to cancel that work trip. That's really important. There's nothing I can do to predict whether that's going to happen. Um, you can then move into some sort of sort of problem solving of like, well, I'm going to put in a couple potential plan A, plan Bs into action, right? But then you have to know when to let go, right? And that's, you know, ultimately what this person is asking. You, you um, have to see it and then understand that um, like, I think it's, it's sort of about um, moderation, right? Yeah. yeah. Especially if you're somebody who is a, like yeah. a gripper, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Like you have to see, like, you're probably going to keep overstepping, yeah. but you have to sort of view it as like a volume dial and pull yourself back and see what it's happening. Um, and it gets easier with practice, but it's hard. This is where I find the older my kids get, at least the easier it becomes, because even when they were as young as, you know, two or three years old, you know, I could say, I find myself getting very frustrated. <laughs> and it's like, you're sort of just saying the words aloud, I think sometimes does give you that control that you need or gives you permission to not be perfect. Um, and also then you feel like, oh, you're parenting by modeling for them that actually it's okay to be frustrated and lose your patience. Um, I find that helpful. Um, and there's one more, one more question. How, was the last one, how important is social connection in caring for yourself? Is there an element of knowing when to ask for help? Oh gosh, that's a big, yeah, that's, a, that's, um, together, right? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's one of the biggest things, right? Because we're, what we're talking about is real self-care in your relationships and understanding how to get your needs met mm -hmm. and also try and meet the needs of others and compromise, right? Um, asking for help is one of the hardest things that my patients struggle with and um, I struggle with too. Um, and that's, part of where you practice the skill of acknowledging where, what you need and naming it and being willing to receive the help. And so, you know, I talk about that actually in the context of self-compassion because you know we're just about up on time, but one of the things that I see often is women who are like, well, yeah, yes, my husband's traveling for a night and yeah, my sister offered to come by and help with bedtime, but I'm fine. I don't need it. And it's sort of like, well, why do you have to be in crisis in order to have an extra hand? Like it's okay to, to get help even when you don't even necessarily need it. Right. And then we can, it'll we be nice. That. We can train that in each other too. I yeah. think, you know, yes. I, I had, um, there was something I begged out of today and um, I was apologizing for it. And my friend who I thought I was disappointing replied and said, I'm so proud of you. For, and I thought, what a gift. Somebody else I asked to do me a favor and it was it was an involved favor of, you know, I was going to be out of town traveling for work. She was going to, she and her husband were going to pick up my kid, was out of their way to go to school. And I was awkward asking. And she said, I'm so glad you asked because now I can ask too. Those yeah. two moments are gifts and we can give them to each other and train each other to, um, to be more asking, I think. Um, yes. I think we're almost out of time. I've, this has been 
Thank you. Um, thank you for this therapy session. <laughs> um, and thank you for this absolutely transformative book. I was with someone yesterday who said that she was almost through reading it already. She got an early copy and oh. it just completely changed the way she approached every relationship in her life, especially the one with herself. And oh. this is like already like a pretty awesome person. And I can't wait to see how much more of her real self she's going to be from having had this book. So thank you. Oh. Thank you, Lauren. This was such a pleasure. Thank you too to the Y for putting this all together and for hosting us. It was just such a lovely evening. Absolutely. What a beautiful way to wrap everything up. So I want to thank Dr. Lakshman and Lauren Smith Brody for this incredible discussion this evening. I'm sure we are all looking forward to incorporating the four self-care principles that we discussed tonight into our daily life, along with taking a second look at how we practice self-care. I hope to, that we'll see everyone for a future Spark Your Health event and stay well, everyone. 